Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith, celebrating 50 years of Agni Literary Magazine. My name is Bonnie, and I'm a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. And if you're familiar with our store, welcome back. Um, and if this is your first time hearing about us, welcome. We're so happy to have everyone here. In case folks don't know, these Events are going to be happening throughout 2022. Um, Agni and Brooklyn Bookness are going to be celebrating the 50th birthday uh, with a series of six intimate virtual conversations, pairing one of the journal's editors with a, contrib with a contributor whose work defines for them the ever evolving Agni aesthetic. Um, today, of course, we have the pleasure of kicking off the series with co editor Sven Burkert and National Book Award finalist Joan Wickersham. Before we begin, I wanna just take a second to talk a little bit about Agni and its amazing impact on our community here in Boston. One of New England's treasures, the literary magazine Agni has reached 50 years old, rare among innovative risk-taking publishers. Agni's mission has always been straightforward to bring its readers into the living moment, not as tourists, but as engaged participants and as means and method to champion writers to engage in the world around them. The magazine has hosted the writing of seven folks who went on to win the Nobel Prize in Literature, um, but it is of course known to many of us uh, as a local home for new, amazing, emerging voices. Uh, housed less than two miles from our store at Boston University, Agni publishes two 250 page issues a year in print and maintains a vibrant online journal of poetry, fiction, essays, reviews, blog posts, interviews, and more with support from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Mass Cultural Council. Agni is of course a beloved institution to our Boston literary community and to us at Brookline Booksmith, um, but it is also an essential part of the literary landscape, not only in Boston, but globally. It is such a pleasure to have everyone here tonight to celebrate this amazing magazine. I'll go ahead and pass the baton to William Pierce to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Bonnie. Well, that's, uh, yes, we're celebrating our 50th anniversary. Um, 1972, Agni was founded by Oskold Melnichuk, a Ukrainian American writer who has been doing a tremendous amount in these past months. Um, during the war on Ukraine, we, we honor him also as we celebrate the magazine's 50th. Um, for those who are so inclined, we encourage you to live tweet the event tonight. Uh, Sven's handle is at CyberBurk. People who follow him know he's very active. And uh, we're also using the hashtag Joan Wickersham and our own hashtags Agni Conversations and Agni 50th. So this series, was designed not to be about the 50th uh, anniversary or until the editor's roundtable at the end of, of this series, uh, not, not about Agni's history even, but about the stuff that Agni itself is about, about reading, about writing, um, and about our own um, sense of, well, sensibilities and um, our own sense of what happens between writer and reader and editor. Joan Wickersham is a genre-defying writer. She's the author of a personal investigation called The Suicide Index, which was the finalist for the National Book Award, of the story collection The News from Spain, whose stories are all called The News from Spain, and an upcoming volume of her Vasa pieces, which resemble poems, but may have more in common with memoir and historical fiction. Sven Burkertz, in addition to being co-editor of Agni with me, is one of the country's foremost critics and literary essayists. He has also published craft books, a memoir, and several books about reading. The two who are talking tonight are two of the writers I know who are best to talk with about writing and reading and what it is we all care so much about. Um, I've had the real honor and pleasure of being able to do that one-on-one -on -one with both of them many times. And um, to have that happen now publicly, I think is, is a wonderful and important thing. I was recently reading Sven's essay on, on Zebald's, W.G. Sebald's first book, Vertigo. And uh, 
There's a quote in there that made me think of tonight. Books are so easily hidden away, Sven wrote, behind their deceptive familiarity, crowded into indistinctness by others of their kind, their original explosiveness gone latent until some circumstance or need in the life of the reader makes them actual, as the writing was for the writer. Books are singularities, trade routes for private intensities. We forget this. We're about to hear from two of the writers that I trust most to keep it in mind as much as possible. Sven and Joan, thank you for being here. <clears throat> well, thank you, Bill. Obviously, thank you, Joan, for agreeing to do this. Um, for my part, um, if we're talking 50th, it's uh, not even possible to comprehend that number. Um, <clears throat> but uh, I think the tradition has held, I mean, I've known Oskold for a million years, and um, there's a, a line of continuity that I think um, marks this magazine in some ways out from other ones. And uh, I'm really honored to be able to be sort of in on the, the first part of the launch and to be in on it with a writer I admire as much as I admire Joan Wickersham. And uh, so I've been thinking about this for days and days and there's just so many, so much to talk about, so many questions I have and I had to keep trying to think, how would I reduce this to a slightly uh, videogenic format? And I found that I kept going back to the image of an arc, um, which I see as kind of the arc of origin conception, the work, the refinement of the work, the problems of the work, and then the arc being an arc ends like a rainbow at the other end with a pot of gold. Um, so that's kind of the motif I had in my mind. I have so many um, things that I'm curious about. Mostly I want to talk more directly about, uh, you know, process and so on. But I did think in the light of all this, because I've never heard Joan actually uh, comment on this in any way. <clears throat> but if we talk about beginnings, and I just wonder if there is um, something that stands out or that you feel you can actually narrate around this is, um, where do you locate the origin of wanting to write in your life? And uh, how long was it before you found a way to take the leap of faith that became the writing? Do you remember? Well, first of all, I wanna thank you for inviting me, Sven. I'm so thrilled and honored to be here. And um, I'm really looking forward to having the conversation. And I also wanted to say that when you began asking this question and you began with the word ARC, I immediately heard it as A-R-K. <laughs> and I was thinking about how um, Agni is such an ARC for writers and for readers, just as a, as a real haven, I think, for looking for, um, I love that quote that Bill began with with the with, with your quote with the um the trade routes to up to private intensities and I just think that's exactly what um, what I think the magazine is but also what writing became for me um, once I got going but you were asking now about what got me going and I had a um I had a teacher in uh, fifth grade who was passionate about books and who made reading seem like the most exciting thing that one could be doing and she really kept track of all of her students uh, favorite books and she said you know if you love this then you would love that and she made a big deal of going to the library and she also assigned us every three weeks to write what she called a creative story and basically I look back at what she did what she did was give us prompts and of course we didn't know that that's what she was doing she had a she would she would give you some idea or a first sentence, or I remember she also had a big box of uh, pictures cut from magazines and you could rummage through the box and pick a picture and then 
you wrote your creative story and then everybody read the work aloud every you know so so this was this was sort of the the engine of her class was this excitement about reading and writing and it just really it really i was already a big reader but i think she really gave me the the confidence to um to fall in love with writing and that said it took me a really long time before the writing started to at all express what i really felt or what I really cared about. I didn't know what I really felt or what I really cared about. So <laughs> what I did was I began with imitating. You know, I just I just wrote a lot of very imitative things. And um, I think that's how many of us begin writing. Um, and it, it takes a while. I think that's how I that's how I was learning. And when would you say just in the uh, <clears throat> the arc of your life, um, did you actually say to yourself, inwardly or outwardly, um, I'm going to be a writer and actually take it on in that sort of more public mode that we all now live in. Um, when did that happen? I said it privately to myself when I was a teenager, but I didn't say it publicly for <laughs> until I was in my 40s, probably. Um, you know, I, I, I knew it's what I wanted to do, but I, I also knew I wasn't doing it as well as I wanted to do it. And it just seemed like a, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to a writing program and I didn't, you know, it was very private um, for me for a long time. Is that a matter of um, confidence or material? It was both. both, it was, it was both. I think it took a long time for me to, um, to find, what was the right writing for me to be doing? And I think um, I was, a, again, beginning with imitation, but I think then I went through a, a long stage where I was a very polite writer and I was trying to do it the way you were supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably something that, again, a lot of people go through that you have, to, you have to try to do it the way you think you're supposed to do it. And then something in you gets so, for me anyway, I got so angry at trying to do it that way, that I think I just had to bust out. Bust out that would have been the uh, axe that cracked the frozen sea then, sort of getting to that point of that. <clears throat> Hell would I have to say it and just begin. So I read an interesting interview or discussion with you in, um, I think it was Solstice Magazine. I hope I have that right. And, um, you talked a lot about getting to the point of uh, finding the path of the, the book, The Suicide Index, and how it began apparently originally in the realm of fiction and migrated, um, which reminds me a little bit. I was years ago, I don't want to date myself, but in a writing group, uh, and Mary Carr was in it. And we sat around for months and months passing around the Liars Club as a novel, you know, and then it wasn't quite hitting it. Whatever it is she wanted, it was not there. And then I don't know under what pressure or uh, whatever, she uh, was coaxed into trying some pages in the personal mode and, you know, it just took off <laughs> like a horse out of a barn or something. Um, and so when you, you were working extremely sensitive and difficult material and trying to find a way to wrap it and convey it. And it took you quite a while, I think, to find both, find your way into the nonfiction corral and also to um, find the particular constraint that finally released it. So I just wanted to hear about that process because I know a lot of writers here are probably listening um and you know we all have our sort of private murky paths that we you know keep following until one day hopefully ideally you know the light breaks and uh we see what what's got to be but i'd like to hear a little about that period and that transformation fiction to non-fiction and non-fiction to index, I'm sure you know. Yeah. Um, 
you know, my father killed himself in 1991 and I started to write, I knew right away that I wanted to write about it. You know, when, when you talk about what's the beginning of a project for, for, for this book, it was obviously this event um, where it, it was such a, um, such a shocking thing and such a kind of mysterious, mysterious thing that I wanted to, I wanted to write about it. And I wanted to try to figure out what, what, what was that, you know, what happened, what, what led to that and what, um, what resulted from that and what was, what was going on with him and what was the impact on, on our family. Um, all of which was very, um, when I started, you know, when you, you just used the word murky, it was very, very murky. Um, so I, I, I really didn't know what I was going to do or how I was going to do it. But I started to write about four years after his death and I worked on a novel. Um, I was sure it was going to be a novel and it was going to be, um, you know, a third person novel, which both of which, I think that's partly because that's what I had mostly done before was third person fiction, but also I think it was a way of keep trying to keep it all at a, at a safe distance, you know, and, and some of that is emotionally um, holding oneself off the experience, but some of it, I think, I think I was trying to do something that would be in good taste, which just seems outrageous to me now. There's the axe again. Yeah, I just feel like what, 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 you know, and and again, I think it was the the years of trying to do, you know, and I ended up with, I, I had a manuscript. I did, I did complete a novel manuscript. Um, and I think I, I, I think I finished that novel in about 2002 or 2003. So it took me about eight, eight years to, to write that. Yeah. And um, it didn't sell. And at the time that seemed devastating to me. Um, and now I feel looking back, that was a real blessing. And I think it, it was, it was too polite. I mean, I just, I, I think it was, uh, it didn't really reflect truthfully this, uh, this violent chaotic experience. And so then what happened was I put it away kind of heartbroken and um, I got a residency at McDowell and I took the manuscript with me uh, and it had been sitting then for about a year, just, you know, in a closet. And I took it with me and I, read through it and I thought maybe I could revise this because I still, I couldn't let go of wanting to write this and wanting to figure it out. Mm. Um, and so then I went through the manuscript and it was, I could see what was wrong with it. And that's something I will say to writers who are you know, listening to this is often, uh, I think letting, letting a manuscript cool off for a long time is a really good idea. And sometimes I've let a manuscript cool off in order to know that it's actually good and it's finished. Um, and then other times I let a manuscript cool off and then I can see exactly what's wrong with it. Or I, I don't see how to fix it, but I, yeah, but I can see what the problems are. And so that's what happened. And so at that point, I just threw it out and I started writing it in a much more fragmented, urgent way that felt much more honest. Um, it also felt like a big mess and that really scared me um, because it, because mm -hmm. In addition to being polite emotionally, I think I was trying to be polite in terms of craft. I was trying, you know, I had, I had tried very hard to, you know, choose a point of view, choose a t verb tense and just kind of mm -hmm. honor that choice. And I think I just finally got to the point where I just said, screw that choice that, you know, this, this is the right voice for this section. That's the right voice for that section. And, and there was a way that I just couldn't, I couldn't keep it up anymore. So, um, and the, the question of genre that you raised didn't actually come up for me. I, I, I actually uh, had with me at McDowell, Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. And that mm -hmm. book really gave me permission to just forget about genre completely. Um, I, 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 I really admire the way that book is right on that knife edge between fiction and memoir. And I think there's a way that he doesn't, he doesn't jerk you around. You, you know, it, there, there are, things in that book that point to memoir and there are things in that book that point to fiction but I always felt that I that I knew that he was deliberately in that territory um right. that, that he was he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't irresponsibly doing that he was he was 
doing it for a reason. And so it gave me permission to just stay in that territory and not worry about genre. Um, and the index, the book, the book is organized in the form of an index. So the chapters are alphabetized. And um, I, I came upon that actually quite a bit later, uh, even than the McDowell residency. I came out of the McDowell residency with a bunch of fragments, but I didn't know what to do with the fragments. And this goes back to your question about the ARC ARC. Um, that I that I knew that I uh, needed something to kind of bring the reader through, but I also felt that the experience of suicide and its aftermath was inherently messy, and so the idea of any kind of arc felt like disloyalty to the subject because it just felt like, you know, I can't pretend that this is has a beginning, middle, and end because it absolutely doesn't, and I can't pretend that there's any kind of neat resolution because there isn't. Um, and so the index was in a way, a kind of, I stumbled on it and it was a kind of a ridiculously formal, I mean, talk about polite. Uh, there's nothing more polite than an index. And I think there was a way that I kind of um, felt like it was almost pointing out how ridiculous the idea of putting something like this in any kind of order is. And that's maybe why it worked. So if we think of that in terms of the murk of the actual event and your psychological processing of it. Um, and you saw the early attempt to fictionalize and formalize as a kind of way of putting distance. An index within the genre of nonfiction is also, I mean, it's, it's a careful distancing, you know, it breaks it into, you know, components in a way and allows you all sorts of organizational moves. Did you find in doing that <clears throat> that you were also via that process getting to the heart of what needed for you to be said, you know, what you needed to say? Yeah, I think, I think that's right, but I think it was not conscious. You know, one of the things that is really tricky that I find about writing is to stay um, to stay, to, to do what you need to do, but stay unaware, unaware of what you're doing long enough to actually do it. You know, you. If you're, yes. if I, you know, if I get too aware of what I'm doing, then I can't, I can't do it anymore. Absolutely. And so I, I think there's a way that in hindsight, I think everything you said was absolutely true, but I didn't see it at the time. Mm. Interesting. I want to jump forward in time a little bit. I did make a little note um, while you were talking. Maybe this is just something to touch on and if we come back to it, we do or we don't. But I mean, I always fixate on the concept of constraint because that's so evidently a uh, vital productive constraint. Um, and then we also have been talking about that sort of it's not fudging, it's just a kind of openness between genres. And uh, so I, I wonder both within your, you know, genre, which I guess we call nonfiction, memoiristic, you're operating under constraint and genres themselves are constraints. So it wouldn't, you know, fiction and nonfiction blend together, but there's something that also um, marks the difference. So if somebody picks something up and says a novel, you know, obviously they read it very differently, which is, I've been fascinated by <clears throat> thinking about this in terms of uh, Joanne Beard's The Boys of My Youth, which is billed by the publisher as a novel, you know, and it's just clearly <laughs> bursting memoiristically forward. Um, and just that little wavering between the genres is kind of exciting. I'm not sure why, but um, it slightly unsettles the expectations, I guess. So, but anyway, that's that. Um, I've been for a long time, both in conversation with you and in other forms like reading parts, um, been following your project with, um, Vasa. And I thought for readers and listeners, I mean, to uh, tune in, 
if you could give just a very short biographical, autobiographical account of what that project is, and then we can. Yeah, um, the Vasa is a um, 17th century Swedish warship that uh, was built to be the sort of fanciest and scariest war machine of its time. And it was launched to great fanfare and sank minutes into its maiden voyage because it was so grotesquely over-designed and, and top heavy and just a great, a great disaster and embarrassment. And it sank in the harbor of Stockholm and it was under the water for 300 years. And then in the 1950s, it was rediscovered and raised and they built a museum around it. And so you can go and see this museum in Stockholm. And my husband, Jay, had read about the ship as a kid, wanted to see the museum when we were in Stockholm, dragged me to it. I didn't mm -hmm. want to see it. And then we walked in and there is this ship in the darkness, this gigantic wooden mysterious warship. And I had, I, I, I just was overwhelmed by how beautiful and mysterious it was. It just kind of hit me and I fell in love with it. And I just started writing. Um, and so the, the, this Vasa project that I'm doing is this book length series of about 60 uh, poem poems or poem like pieces that are responding in some way to the to the ship and that are just kind of the ship is always at the center in some way but they're personal associative meditative poems that just are kind of going like this but you know Sven it's so interesting because I know you have a real interest in the in in the whole question of time and how oh, yeah. time works in memoir and I, I I'd love to hear you talk more about that as well uh, but for me, the when I walked in and saw that ship, I think what happened was it it's it looks like a museum, you know, it's a museum object. It's a full size warship in a building, but it also is somehow as if you're walking onto the dock and seeing the ship before it was launched. So it's kind of the thing hasn't happened yet that's going to happen to this ship. And at the same time, it's like you're standing on the seabed looking at a shipwreck. And, and so at all, all those times of the ship's story are there in the first second that you see it. And I think there was something about that collision of all mm -hmm. those different layers of time that just thrilled me. And it's like, I saw the whole thing right there, although I clearly have a lot more learning right, to do right, right. what happened, but that it was an explosion of a kind of simultane simultaneity of different different layers and of in time all at once. Mm. But it also, I, I've been fond of this notion for a long time that all of us have something that I conceptualize as kind of internal water table. And what I mean is that when you're just driving or walking, your mind goes to a certain place. It's just a default almost. This is who I am. I'm thinking more about this than anything else. And it sounds to me like when you saw that and were sort of uh, overtaken by it or, you know, mesmerized or captivated, it must have simultaneously, you must have known at that second that it was going to hit a lot of your, your notes, you know, the things, because I know from the parts I've read, I mean, it's, you know, it's personal, it's deep history, it's hands-on archaeological it's biblical it's it's just a center for a whole set of sort of uh, vectors going out that allow you this on the one hand tremendous freedom and i guess as always it presents the problem of okay i have a, a hundred different angles on this um Am I going to let it be a hundred different angles, or am I going to sort of find a gestalt that holds those angles? You know. Yeah, and that that I think that has been a challenge with this project. There's just so much information that I've learned, and all of it's fascinating. And it it, but sometimes um, to to try to put it all in, uh, it, it loses you know it loses focus, and so so it it sort of, um, you know, in addition to letting a manuscript sit just to let it cool off so you can see what it is. Sometimes I think you have to let um, a lot of different facts and, and you have to let your excitement calm down 
um, enough so that you can sort of see what you're, you, you could see what is needed to do. You know, it's funny, um, sometimes I will read a, a biography, a big fat biography, and I feel like, oh, that person put in every single index card that they had, you know, just they couldn't leave out one fact, you know, if they knew what the person had for lunch, they had to tell you what the person had for lunch, even if you're just stupefied by the amount of detail. And I think with the VASA, the, the challenge has been to just um, write, write fat, but edit lean. Um, uh -huh. But uh, I was just <clears throat> thinking I've been working on also a kind of very different but historical project that does involve photography as Vasa does, I think, as well. And what you said about the initial excitement and needing it to cool. I find this in drafts when I've gotten really excited, I get way too lyrical. And the whole work of revision is curbing, reducing, and you know, getting rid of that, which is the excitement expressing itself, but it's too much in front of whatever it is I'm trying to get at, you know. Yeah, but but it's good, it's good to. I, you know, part of what I, I wanted to ask you about is having edited so much and having been, you know, have such a, a, a good critical eye, how do you keep alive the freedom to fool around? Like, like you, you know, like how do you, because, because in a way that kind of exuberance that we're talking about is necessary for a project and it's terrific. So, I mean, I think, I think the idea of getting too rigorous too soon um, is it, that's, that's not good. Yeah. Um, well, eventually you have to get rigorous, but at the beginning, if you've got that froth. Sure, no, I'm totally, totally uh, with you. And I would say probably at least once a month and maybe more often in the course of any writing you know, situation, I come to a moment where I have to stop and remind myself that it's all about the pleasure of the sentence, the words, and just let it go and have fun, exactly as you said. Um, but also in this, your question in a way touches on something I wanna ask as well, um, not only about Vasa, but any piece of writing that you work on. And I'm gonna use a, uh, sort of crippled little analogy, but um, because I'm, <laughs> anyway, it's a Siri analogy and Siri is forever redirecting me and telling me to get back on course because I'll follow something and Siri will appear to get very angry with me. They're re rerouting, reroot, you know, um, but it's part of the whole, engagement I think as we go along is we think we're going somewhere and then off from the side kind of a little voice in the ear start pulling you off the road a little bit and then you have to struggle to know is this something I should do or I should stay on the road you know all of that and um, I'm guessing there's a kind of universal for people who are trying to get at all this stuff but um, what you just said, do you uh, give yourself a leash suddenly? Just say, eh, go on, you know, within the larger package of this is what I'm doing, but I'm going to try this out. I'm going to go way over here and, you know, whatever. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I have about 16 different answers to that question. Um, <laughs> one is, I certainly have, have, things that I thought were gonna turn into something that I actually put a lot of time into and they didn't. Um, but sometimes they then resurface in some other place in some other way. I mean, I was working for some years, I was trying to write a book about a, a kind of semi-professional opera singer. I had this, I, I thought that that was an interesting idea. Um, and I just couldn't, I couldn't, it just never, never got off the runway. Um, but but I did a lot of thinking about Mozart's operas while I was doing that, um, and then put it away and forgot about it. But then the Mozart opera um, theme emerged again in um, one of the News from Spain stories. So I, I think I, I was I was wrestling with material that was very interesting to me, but I was also wrestling with a lot of stuff that 
ultimately wasn't didn't work mm -hmm. but but that thing survived and popped up again so that's 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 one piece of it um another piece that that i am struggling with right now or have been for the last few years and i think this is maybe something that happens as we get older is i am finding that my mother is coming into every project that i'm working on and i don't know or does that mean they're all one thing or does that mean mm. she's, she's she's got you know she's got her fingers in every i am totally I just... following you on that exactly that's why i'm suddenly at age 100 i'm finding that well, here's mother you know and dad but mother especially somehow and i keep marveling at that sort of you know Psychologically, I thought, well, I'm sort of done with that, but it's coming back with a vengeance, you know, nature with a pitchfork. Yeah. Um, and do you, do you, do you sort of, um, are you confused about where she, which things she belongs in and which pieces of her belong where? Yes, always. But fortunately, I have a sufficiently fragmented uh, project that I can sort of export and import a little bit. But I know that's a question that's big for you is, different things where do i put them what mode do i put them in what you know what container is this uh, part of a story is this you know a close personal essay is it a, you know i don't know if there's an answer but what do you think well you know it's interesting this goes back to your the way i like to think about it is goes back to your question about constraints um you know um, my husband jay uh, is is trained as an architect and when i was struggling with the, the suicide book and i came up with the idea of the index i worked on the index for a few days and then i just said to him i think this is too gimmicky i don't think this is going to work and what he told me was that um architects architecture students at the ecole de beaux-arts in paris are trained to design using something called a party mm. and um the idea is that you come up with a kind of concept of the building that guides you through the design process and the concept may actually be apparent in the final building or it may be kind of so submerged by then that a viewer wouldn't see it but it kind of helped get you through and he and he said to me why don't you just use the index as a party and then if it works you'll keep it and if it doesn't work it will help you generate material you know, and so, and I think about that a lot when I'm working and I'm, I'm completely flummoxed by what is the form of this. I think, okay, just try a party. Um, and if it, if it, and mostly I try parties that don't work, you know, so it, 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 right. it, it it's kind of like, it, it's almost like trying, it's like you have a big ring of keys and you have to try them all to see which one mm -hmm. is going to fit in the lock. Um, so it's a very frustrating process, but, um, but I think it's an interesting working method to yeah. try to deal with uncertainty is just, you know, come up with a party and just try it for a while and see if it works. And if it, if it, if it does it great, but, sure. but if, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't, at least it will tell you some, something more about that exactly problem or project that you need to know. I have a sheet with just vague prompting scrawls that I sort of occasionally glance at, but one I wrote down earlier as a question that I sort of wanted to ask you is, is there a ghost outline in your head that you try to fill out, which is pretty much exactly what you were just talking about? Yeah, I mean, what leads what? You know, is it the sudden burst this way or that way? Or are you always aware of this kind of sketched in structure that you're making real or you know but yeah anyway that's um yeah but i love the idea of the ghost the go it's not so much a ghost outline but sometimes i feel like i can see the thing in the distance and i i yeah. just i'm trying to get close to it and i it's 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 tantalizing sure. but, uh, but frustrating <laughs> Um, but I'm sure everybody struggles with that. I mean, I my way of thinking of it is more like chicken and egg that I can't I can't write it because I don't know what it is, but I won't know what it is. Till I write. <laughs> right. So I, I suspect soon we might want to entertain um, questions if people have. Them. I did want to end on one. I mean, not end, but um, 
we talked about a lot about you know the origin moments of certain things we talked a lot about the process of getting there but how do you know if something's done how do you know you've filled the sketch in or there's just so much more to say or you know everyone knows the valerie quote we don't ever complete a work we just decide when to abandon it but um how do you deal with that well you know it's interesting because when you and i were you know talking in a preliminary way about this conversation we were using a lot of uh, fish imagery um and my fish image about knowing when something is done is when it stops thrashing in the net um <laughs> but that takes a while you know so, sometimes i just have i i think with Vasa, for example, I thought it was finished. And with, with the suicide book, I thought it was finished. And then it just kept thrashing in the net and I had to keep going back to it. With the news from Spain, I actually thought that there was one more story. I thought there was going to be a kind of Uber story that would connect all uh -huh. the stories. And um, I actually let the manuscript sit for a while and it never thrashed again in the net. It just, it, it clearly was finished. And I realized I, I didn't need that overarching story at all. Um, so yeah. it's, 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 in, it's instinctive. I, you know, it's funny, I'm talking, and I, I feel I need to be honest about this. I, I'm talking as if I'm a very patient writer. And in exactly. hindsight, I, I think I am, you know, I feel like, yeah, I, I guess I am because it takes forever and I, I let things sit, but that's not choice. You know, that's not wisdom. That's just, I, I hit a wall and I don't know what else to do. You know, right. it's, it's, I, I'm a very impatient writer, but I just Those can't. Wind up that things that don't stop when they reach the wall is. Yeah. Um, I see Bill there. Hi, Bill. Um, oh. Is it time for us to take on some? I think it's a good time. Yeah, there's a, there's a question and uh, other people can ask questions and I have a couple of my own. And, okay. and then, of course, the two of you can just pick up and, and carry forward oh, whatever sure. you want to along the way. Um, Andrew Zubiri, who is one of the writers in our spring issue, asks, yeah. How do we find the various parties in our writing process as you, Joan, did in the form of an index? I, I don't, I think it's just, um, it, it, maybe it goes back to that question at the beginning about pl play, being play, playful and just fool, giving ourselves permission to fool around. Um, sometimes it is um, th just, Giving yourself, giving yourself an assignment arbitrarily, you know, just thinking about uh, the parties that you, maybe you could make a list of parties and just try them. But I, I think, I think it's, I think it's kind of intuitively sensing a, con a connection between, um, for example, the index, I think maybe worked because I was, I was so numb, I was writing about numbness. And maybe that that's where the index came from. Also, it's a numb form, but I don't think there's a right hmm. guiding answer to that. I think it's more just, I think maybe the party, rather than being something that you try to find, I think it's more to try to maintain, if you think you have found the party, try to maintain your faith in the party long enough to really give it a chance and generate generate the work and then you can start to say okay this is working or this is not working or whatever but it so to, to me the party isn't so much about how do you stumble on it it's more how do you stick with it um yeah, that's you don't want to be a party pooper <laughs> sorry that pays me back for my <laughs> um i did write down in one of these scrawls too is that i thought in a way every let's call it successful work, something that seems to get somewhere in its own terms is the pro product of an obsession. But it's not, you sort of think of this may be a good idea, but finally something drives it. And I'm trying to relate that to the concept of the party. You know, what originates the original structure probably has elements in some form of the obsession that is you know driving it it's a fulfilling of it but what form is that going to take you know yeah well you know one of the things that i think about personally about obsession i do think books are fueled by obsession but i also personally find something very embarrassing about obsessions you know because it's it's until until you've written the book 
nobody understands what you're doing. Nobody, mm. nobody understands why you're so, why you can't just either let it go or why you can't, you know, what, why are you? And so there's a way that maybe the party gives you a structure. You know, I think it's a, it's a kind of a, um, it's something to, to hold on to so that you're not just right. wallowing Absolutely. In, yeah, in the obsession. But I definitely, I definitely think that that's, that's one of the maybe psychological um, issues of writing is, is how to, how to give yourself permission to lose yourself in this inexplicable thing that nobody else can give you permission to do. If you'd like to quote that somewhere, that's a very well said, and that's very true of, uh, I think, what we do. Um, I see a couple other questions have popped up on the question. Yeah, you know, I, was, I was just thinking of the ways in which um, party can be um, structural, can be thematic, and then in some cases, I guess best cases, you'd have the two overlap, the two be one, um, structural and thematic. So Sharon Bryan asks, how far into the Vasa project were you when you realized it was poems? The first poems I saw, she says, in Agni were so accomplished, it seemed as if they couldn't be anything else. Well, first of all, thank you and, and hi, Sharon. Um, it, 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 um, I knew right away that that's, I mean, that's just how they came out. I actually thought that I was just gonna write a little essay about the Agni, about, about the Agni, about the, um, the Vasa. And then I, I I sat down instead, and what came out was this um, this this piece that was sort of ad addressing a um, an imaginary sailor that was in the wreck and was trying to swim to shore. The, the The ship sank very close to shore, so most of the people that were on it actually were able to get to shore. And I just found myself talking to him, and it came out as a as a as a poem. And then the next morning, I woke up and I wrote another one that was addressed to the widow. Of the shipbuilder, the shipbuilder died in mid-design, and his wife had to finish the job, and then got stuck with the disgrace, and that oh. reminded me again of my mother and the aftermath of my father's death. So I, I, I felt like I knew right away that they were that, that they were these poem-like creatures, um, and and again, it, it. So the form of the the form of the thing was there right away, but I didn't I didn't I didn't know if I could. Do it, and if they, I didn't know if the obsession would last for the length of a book length project, but it, but it has. Um, Interesting. Another question here: uh, Dan McDermott asks, "How much editing do you do throughout the initial draft of the novel? Do you rework and seek critique, seek critique in sections as you go, or do you recommend getting the rough story out before looking back and making alterations or or accepting the opinions of others?" I, I don't show my work very much um, because I just, I'm so easily crushed that um, it's really hard for me to, to, to assimilate. So I, I, I wait, I just, I just, I, I, um, I do a lot of editing as I go. I write something over and over and over, um, you know, and, and, and try to, try to keep it moving and try to keep improving it and fixing it as I go. And then I don't really show it to anybody until I think it's done. Um, except for my husband, I will show him things that are in progress. And he's actually really good at uh, telling me what he sees. You know, this is interesting because when I, when I teach writing, I try to, um, when I'm responding to a piece of writing, I try to say, okay, here's what I'm seeing. Here's what, here's what I think is here, here and this is what, this is what I'm getting from what's on the page. I think it's really hard when you're working because you have the whole thing in your head and it's kind of vibrating. You can't tell what actually made it to the page. So that's the most thing I think, most mm -hmm. useful thing. I think if people are exchanging work or you're showing a friend your work, I don't want to hear like, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> That doesn't, that doesn't help me. But what helps me is when somebody says, okay, here's what I'm seeing. And here's, here's what I, here's what I see is here, because then I feel like, oh, they completely get it, or they completely missed it, or they sort of get it, they sort of miss it. That's, that's helpful to me. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that really answers the question. But um, I mean, eventually, I want to know, is it working? Or is it not working? But I don't want to know what while, while it's in progress. 
Chris Walsh asks, um, though you've both focused most on long projects here, I'm wondering how smaller pieces, pieces you might publish in Agni or uh, Joan, in your case, you, you're also doing uh, your column for the Boston Globe, um, how they figure in the mix. And this gets at the larger question of how literary journals uh, figure in your lives as writers, especially in your imaginative, generative lives. Well, I'll answer quickly, but then I'm actually more interested in, in hearing Sven's answer. I, I, um, I love this column. I, I write an op-ed column for the Boston Globe. And what, what I love, going back to Sven's question about constraints, is it's 700 words, it's once a month, and it's due on the, it's due tomorrow. It's due on the Tuesday of the last week of the month. And so I feel like it's so great when I'm in the middle of some other, you know, slimy, murky project to have this word count and this deadline. Um, and I, I, I really, I, I, I think that um, constraints and short pieces are very, very, first of all, it's a different kind of subject that I would tackle in a, in a short piece. And, um, but the discipline of an essay is, is really, really lovely and bracing as a writer. But Sven, I'm interested in hearing your answer to this. <laughs> Well, I would say first, as somebody reviewed under word count and constraint for decades, um, the liberation for me was when the editor that I was dealing with would say, we need to lose 300 words. I got excited because that's when I felt I could go in and shape it. I would say as far as literary magazines and that goes is that um, much more I used to try to come up with something that I could submit and that would be the point of origin and the, the goal now um now i just write and at a certain point i think well some of this is kind of interesting um let me see what i can carve out of it and submit you know um so it's kind of a reverse of where i began but it takes away the that weird pressure of you know you look at it and then you try to think where it might find a home rather than writing toward the home that you hope it will find its way into. Um, which, yeah, for me, just this is writing in later life, but it's very freeing, I think. That connects to another question that we have, which is, can you talk about work that you write uh, that you feel is as good as other work you've done you believe it's as good as other work that's out there, but that's not accepted for publication or not ever published. Um, and then tied to that question by the same uh, person in the audience, is a writer a writer if she, he, they doesn't have an audience as defined by a publisher? Oh. No, no question, yes. <laughs> I can jump in briefly and then let Joan go with this, but... Um... My immediate response to that is, fuck them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> just, you know, I don't ever think, oh, they're right. Though I think there was a time when I thought, oh, they're right. But um, I think it's part of that larger dynamic we're sort of talking about, about certain kinds of permission. And one kind of permission is the permission to trust yourself. And once you do, if somebody says, man, 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 man you know, I don't, it's so, you know, it's probably stupid, but I don't accept it. I think I'm right, you're wrong. Okay, keep going. <clears throat> anyway, I'll stop there, but Joan. Yeah, no, great. I, I, I agree. I agree completely with the fuck em. Um, But it's also, I think it's what I partly read the question, you know, what the question brings up for me is, is the question of becoming demoralized, you know, which happens to me all the time and still, you know, happened to me all the time and still happens to me all the time. I mean, all of these books that we're talking about that, you know, my, my suicide index and the news from Spain, those were difficult books to find a publisher for. Um, and I feel like, you know, and, and it, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to. I don't know how to get around that. You know, the 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 demoralizing aspect of writing, and that you know maybe that goes back to the previous question about the role of literary magazines. You know, it definitely is, you know, wonderful 
as a reader to have this work published so that we can read it. But I also think as writers, it's really lovely to feel like there are places to send, to send things to. And I do think now there are more and more places to send things to. Um, but but it it is it's 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 really hard, I think, to keep keep one's morale up because it's it's I wish in a way that writers would talk more honestly about uh, rejections. And I wish that there was just a, a more realistic sense of how much rejection one gets and how one keeps getting it. And even when you think, I recently got a form rejection from a journal where I've published a lot of work. You know, I got a form letter and it just, uh, and it felt, I, I'm sort of at the point with, with that particular one where I can just say like, you know, but I, I, it, it's, it's, it's a tough, this is a tough world. And I agree with you, Sven, that giving too much power is not, I, 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 I think it's good to get to the point where you don't give away so much, you know, where you don't give it right. so much weight, but I also think it's hard to get to that point. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure I'm there yet. <laughs> yeah, a few more here. Um, whether as an editor, Jennifer Kwan Dobbs asks, whether as an editor or as an author working with editors, what are your thoughts about literary editing as a craft and as an art? Who wants to take that first? Um, I can say a few words. And the first thing I immediately think of is, um, it's the, the person not the position, just in all these years of writing, the editing that has mattered has been the editing coming through a sensibility that I trusted and learned how to read and that showed me what I needed to see. But I've also had a lot of editing that just, well, this is crazy, I don't believe that. You know, they're editing toward something that I'm not writing toward. I mean, I usually relent because there's something, you know, a contract of some kind, you know, it's about to be published here or there, but um, editors are your better selves. They're like your older brother, your older sister, who sort of knows you, but also knows what a fool you are, but sort of loves you anyway. <laughs> they, you know, they step in and... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've had probably five or six just terrific editorial connections in my life. And each one has been so completely instructive. And I hear them as a voice in my head as I go forward writing other things. I can suddenly see them as a kind of super ego hovering there. You know, I say, oh, she, she or he wouldn't like what I'm about to say here, maybe I should rethink, you know, or whatever, but and over to you, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I, I, um, because you, you said that, I, I, I'll talk about the other side of it, which is, um, I've had occasions where I've pushed back, um, and that, you know, that's sometimes interesting to see. I find that there, there's editing where, it helps me realize, um, you know, it, it saves me from myself, and that's really good. And I and I realize when someone says something, I I kind of know in my stomach that they're right, or I have to get over my feeling of being pissed, and then after a while, I know that they're right. Yeah. But then there's also been some stuff that's that I've been asked to do that I just haven't wanted to do, and I've just said, you know, I've just said no, and um, you know, I I, I think. Editing is, it's a collaborative, editing and writing, totally. it's collaborative. And I think that's at its best. That's what it, that's what it is that the editor, when I was, um, when I uh, published the Suicide Index, my editor uh, was a wonderful editor named Ann Patty. And I remember she said to me, she said, my philosophy as an editor is three strikes and I'm out. She said, it's your book. And I will tell you three times, like there, if, if something's really bothering me, I'll point it out to you three times. And then if you still want it in there, we'll leave it in there. That's um, nice, yeah. yeah. Uh, like that. 
What are some, uh, back, back to the idea of constraints, there, there are two more questions. I think we have time to take those two. Um, what are some similarities, Olga Lifshin asks, between the constraints of a poem and the ones of an essay? And what are some differences? I think that goes to Joan. Well, you know, what I, what I feel about this, I don't feel that I know um, as much about poetry as someone who's a poet knows about poetry. So I'll just answer very cautiously about th th these Vasa pieces that I've been working on. What I, what I feel about it is that it, I'm not gonna compare it as much to an essay as I will to writing, writing fiction. Um, that there's a way that, um, first of all, the persona of the writer, you can fudge that fiction, nonfiction question in a poem. Nobody, nobody holds a, the I, the first person of a poet. Um, nobody holds you to that same standard of journalistic truth that you would be held to in an essay. And you also don't have to develop the story over time. You don't have to have a plot the way you would in fiction. So I feel like there is a kind of compression of, um, of, uh, of you, can, you can kind of have everything very compressed in terms of time and in terms of voice in a way that you can't in a narrative. And so for me, I think that's part of why I was drawn to this form for this project that there's in the same way I said to spend that all the pieces of time, the present, past and future all layered and it's all the same thing. Something about that compression really, really worked for me. Um, but I would say that the, the difference for me between with an essay, you're developing something, you're meandering, but you're also developing something logically and there is a sense of narrative progression. Mm -hmm. And with a poem, I think, um, I, tried, I tried in these pieces to, to just start with what I, I, I wasn't writing toward what I knew. I was starting with what I knew and then jumping off into the unknown. And that was, although, you know, that's what I do with fiction and essay. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to the question. And, and poetry has a kind of associative progression. If, if it's not a logical one or rational one, it's, it's an associative one. Um, it also has what other genres maybe have a little less. It has a, whether you ignore it or recognize it, it has a huge um, body of, uh, I don't know, not just theory. I mean, it has generations and centuries of certain defining norms, which have much been abandoned, you know, in our later decades here, but they're still there. I mean, I think when you work on a poem, you can't not think of things like line endings and you know rhythmic variation and so on when you're writing an essay it's looser i mean you're dealing with different things but you're not up against a tradition of the essay that you're trying to play against or with say, but so joan something you said um leads right into this good last question um how much does your writing reveal your views of the subject and how much does it, does it shape your views on what you're writing about? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. Um, I think it's both. You know, I think, I think you, if I really, if, if I really knew my view, I, I probably wouldn't need to write the thing. So I think, I think it is always, a process of trying to figure it out as you go along. But there's something, and this goes back to Sven's question, you know, about um, the spark or the, the origin, the beginning. How do you know the beginning of something? Um, I think I think it's just um, you know, it's like it's like a dog catching a whiff of something. I think there's just some some smell that that appeals to you and then you just you start you start going going after it, and you don't really know what what you're looking for. But um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say I suddenly thought of the uh, 
Eliot line, our beginnings never know our ends, sort of applies. But go, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Yeah, that. no, no, that's 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 it, really. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so many people in their questions said at first, thank you for this rich conversation. And I, I didn't read that out several times, but uh, they were thanking you, I'm thanking you. Uh, that was that was really what we have been hoping this series will be, and so it uh, launches us well into the into the next five. Thank you so much. Well, and to you, my friend. <laughs> Good night, everybody. This was fun. Night, Joan. A few... nice to... And thank you, you after <laughs> several years here. <laughs> so um, I'd also like to thank Agni's associate editor, Shuchi Saraswat and our essential partner in this series, the independent bookstore, Brookline Booksmith, especially Alex Schaffner and Bonnie Adderstrom, and our own Cynthia Ayeza, who ran the chat. Um, as she has noted, Agni's next event is on May 11th, the launch of Agni 95, our spring issue, a fully hybrid event in Boston and on Zoom. And the following event in this series of virtual conversations is on Monday, May 23rd at 8 p.m when poetry editor Jessica Q. Stark will be in conversation with poet Chang Yang Fang. Thank you for joining us this evening, everybody. Good night. Good night. <laughs>